to play with that balance between what they can control and what is outside of their control. Is there anything I can do about it? Or is this just who I am? I'm Heather Grish, and this is the Wisdom of the Body podcast. This podcast explores the idea of body intelligence as the real key to learning the knowledge of life, or what we call Ayurveda in the ancient language of Sanskrit. We do that by connecting with today's creative leaders and experts who will help you listen to your body, trust your gut, and live in deeper harmony with nature. Come join me as we unlock the golden door to clear direct perception and become very deep listeners. You can find the Wisdom of the Body podcast on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can also follow us by joining my email at heathergrish.com or on Instagram at heathergrish. I know you're going to love this podcast, so take a second right now to subscribe. Hey, the topics in this podcast episode are in no way intended to be medical advice. Should you have any questions about anything discussed in this podcast, podcast episode, please reach out to your medical doctor or other healthcare professional. Study any health-related field, and you've likely heard the idea of nature versus nurture. Nature versus nurture, it can be applied to your physical health, your psychological health, and even your social circumstances. I think, in essence, the term makes us think about, well, what of this am I fated for? And what of this do I have the power to influence? And I realized that the first time I've ever heard of this idea of nature versus nurture was when I was taking a psychology class in college. And I was like, what? Wait a minute. I'm not a prisoner to how I was born. And at the same time, I learned, wait, there's only so much I can change because of nature. The debate of nature versus nurture became very evident to me when I went away to do a yoga teacher training 14 years ago. I was in the jungle I showed up as a person who was eating meat for two of my meals every day, and I was working in an office without any access to sunlight or fresh air, and I was sitting in meetings all day at a computer and analyzing things and talking and giving presentations and stuff like that, going into an environment where there wasn't a lot of fresh air, you know, being in a corporate high-rise building, and that's one environment, and I go away to do this yoga teacher training in an environment where there were trees and more humid air and the beach and with waves and delicious organic vegetarian food, which I was highly resistant against eating, by the way, in the beginning, and daily yoga and meditation, so more physical exercise and sweating and talking about concepts that make me happy and curious and feeling really connected to nature and the trees and meditating every morning so that I became very clear and sensitive in a way that I've never experienced in my whole life prior to that moment. I lost eight pounds and I didn't even intend to. This was all nature and nurture. The nurture clearly, clearly, clearly changed. You change your environment, you're changing the nurture. You're feeding yourself different food you're in a different environment, you're with different people, you're exercising differently, you're sleeping differently, you're listening to different sounds, you're taking in different content. Yes, definitely nurture has changed from that corporate life being trapped in a high rise in downtown San Francisco. And yet my nature was still there, holding me in my essence, allowing different parts of me to express. And a lot of my clients, I'll ask them the question, tell me a time in your life where your health felt really different than it does now. And a lot of people will say, oh, my digestion didn't bother me when I was traveling in Europe, or I felt better when I was lifting weights, or I felt better when I was doing this liver detox. This is nurture at work. It could also be part nature because it could be that your nature likes the climate in that part of Europe better or the air pressure or the specific types of food that grow locally there, or you felt better when you were lifting weights, then maybe you have the body type that needs a little more help to cultivate structural stability. And nowhere does the question of nature versus nurture come up more than when a person has an illness or some type of imbalance. It may also come up for people when they're trying to improve their life or their health in some way, or trying to understand how to do that for someone else. 
because behind all efforts of improvement is a belief and understanding, or at least an assumption, that something must be changed. It gets into tricky territory sometimes because our child brain, which is the one that doesn't feel like it has control over our life or our body or the world, child brain sometimes think it has less power than it does. And this is where we might see people blaming or ourselves blaming. And this blame starts to arise that this didn't happen because of anything I did. It happened because of something outside of me. And the revolutionary adult mind, not the child mind, but the revolutionary adult mind whose job it is essentially to take us out of the darkness and powerlessness of that child mind sometimes thinks it has lost total control over everything and wants to gain control over everything. The revolutionary adult mind says, I'm not a victim of my past. I am the ruler of my universe. And most people toggle between these two things. And whether you're in one space or the other becomes evident when there is an event that occurs that forces you to look at why it happened. So let me give you a practical example of what this looks like. Say you show up late for a meeting that you're supposed to be running and what's going through your head at that time is all the things that happened to you that are forcing you to be late for that meeting. Your boss kept you late in the other meeting or it took you longer to drive somewhere than you thought or you went late with a client in your last meeting. These are all examples of the type of focus on what is out of your control that caused you to be in the situation. I'm late because my client wouldn't stop talking or I'm late because my boss made me stay late. They're putting the blame for what happened on someone else. Now, the person who is in the full-on, I am the ruler of my destiny mindset, well, they're probably not going to be late to the meeting because they're more likely to be in the mindset where they believe they have control over their circumstances and they will show up for that meeting and they will expect everyone else to be there and they will be a little bit irritated when other people aren't there on time. And they may say things like, if I can get here on time, well, you should be able to get here on time, which can come off as angry and irritating to other people. Or they may try to implement policies or tactics for that other person to be able to show up on time so that they don't have to be inconvenienced by that person. And they may actually believe that they are the savior of that other person who is always late because they are the one who does everything and has all the control, right? There are actually some Sanskrit terms for these mental qualities. The child that believes it has no control over anything and wants to blame what it perceives as the authority or the real controller, that child mind is called tamas in Sanskrit. Tamas is a mental quality that is bathed in ignorance and inertia. This revolutionary mind that I was talking about is the one full of passion and change and dynamism. This mind is the rajasic mind. It believes it has complete agency. It believes it has full control. So that is the quality of rajas. The person tries to fix everything all the time for himself and also for everyone else. So tamas and rajas, and most people are toggling between these two qualities. It's very easy to see this in children. It's harder to see it in adults. It takes a lot of other forms. But in children, when they're going through this process of reaching many different developmental milestones, you know, they learn how to brush their teeth on their own instead of having their parent brush their teeth for them. They wipe themselves when they go to the bathroom instead of having their parents do that for them. They can dress themselves. They can take their plate up to the counter when they're done. And eventually they may make their own bed. They may learn to read. And instead of having someone read to them, at some point they will perhaps read to their parent. So when a child says, no, I want to do it, That is the exercising of more of that rajasic quality. And when they say, I want you to do it for me, they're back in that baby mind. So as a child gains agency, there is a reduction in that tamas quality. But sometimes when we're in our adult stage, we carry forward the qualities of tamas in certain areas where we may be holding onto traumas or imbalances in the past. No, the solution is not to go all the way to the other edge and believe that we are beings that have full control over everything, though empowerment is important, but going all the way to the other edge is also dangerous because it doesn't recognize that there are truly things outside of your control. And that's where manifestation work 
gets super tricky. And here's a fascinating question to ask yourself. Which one of these two mental qualities is more powerful? I'm just going to let you contemplate that for a second. I think Rajas will see more effects and change occur that they will have their obvious stamp on in the world. But the tamasic quality is actually a quiet controller of the human mind and frankly of society too. It's ignorance. You can apply all these things to large groups of people because when we're together, we're basically just like bigger minds than when we are alone. But there's actually a third option. The third mental quality is sattva. Sattva is pure and luminous and it's free from blaming. And at the same time, it's free from the pressure of being the fixer of everything. Sattva is purity and clarity and understanding. Sattva is without the grips of emotion. Sattva is without the residue of blame, the residue of laziness or being ruled by desire. When we try to live a virtuous, pure life, because it really is a virtuous, pure life that leads us toward health, this is the path of sattva. When we eat clean foods that don't clog up our bodies or make us feel heavy or cause inflammation, when we surround ourselves with other people with clear minds, an inner environment is cultivated that allows for the mind to have more clarity. So we're always moving the three different qualities in and out of them. And it's interesting to observe when you may be in one of these states. And there's no more obvious opportunity to look at this than when you're experiencing some sort of stressor that occurred. So when you notice some sign of stress in your body, that's your sign to pay attention to your mind. And you get to see what reflexes are occurring in your mind to a certain stimulus outside of you. And if you've been meditating, any type of self-awareness practice that allows you to observe your own thoughts, then you can really study this. And you can learn what your mind is made of, not just the information in your mind, that's easy to see, but the energy or the qualities of your mind. This is how you start to sort through what your beliefs are and get clarity. So you can really find what your actual essence is. Someone concerned about nature versus nurture might get caught up between this tamasic and rajasic mind because they don't want to look at the part that they're playing in something. They might want to remain in a state of ignorance unknowingly. And when they have that quality and are in that state, it will be difficult for them to transcend whatever circumstances they find themselves in. They may feel like a prisoner to nature, God, or whatever else they perceive is bigger than them. On a pendulum swing all the way to the other side, the person who is very rajasic may obsess over the nurture piece. But what is wholesome is to recognize that our lives are a convergence of the things that we do with the things that happen to us and are happening to us now. And we should study ourselves to learn how much control we really have over something and play with those edges. Cultivate the quality of sattva in your diet, in what you consume, also in terms of what you read and watch. And that can make it a lot easier to find a sense of balance and flow in the world. And I think that when someone's dealing, perhaps with a health issue or not being able to achieve a certain health state that they're looking for, they want to play with that balance between what they can control and what is outside of their control. Is there anything I can do about it? Or is this just who I am? Because I want to know myself really deeply. I want to know who I am. And when my body fails me, or doesn't feel well, I feel like I don't know myself. I think when we have this realization, which I have actually had this realization before in my life, you start to feel like you've been carrying this body, carrying all this around with you your whole life, and you don't really understand it. You don't understand how it works. You don't understand how it feels. You don't know what it needs. And frankly, you're thinking 
certain assumptions that may not even be true about it. And it can get, you know, challenging to try to integrate all of these things. But the beautiful thing is that with self-awareness practices like yoga and meditation or anything you do that has components of drawing your attention inward toward what you are doing, thinking, and feeling and holding that meditation there for a long time so that you can begin to observe patterns, the patterns inside you, the patterns going on solely inside you and the patterns going on when you interact with certain things in the world. If you can hold that meditation there to see those patterns, then not only do you start to see root causes, but you also develop more trust in yourself. And if you only study this on a mental level, you're not going to understand the complete picture. And that's my big beef with psychology. This is why I decided not to get a PhD in psychology. And instead, I studied Ayurveda. We have to look when we want to look at root causes, we have to look at the mental, the physical and the emotional and the environmental because everything converges. And that's really our big issue in modern medicine because it's so compartmentalized in all the various medical disciplines. And oftentimes the providers don't talk to each other. So it's really requiring each individual to be the integrator of all of this information so that they're learning about themselves from different types of healthcare providers. And many people that are doing that are coming from a place of not knowing anything about how their body works or how their mind works. So it's a little tricky for them to integrate that, which is why I wish everybody would do a yoga teacher training at some point in their life. And I'm super glad that I also studied Ayurveda because it helped me integrate these parts. So pause for a moment. Give yourself, first of all, a recognition that the world, yes, happens to you. And yes, the world is yours to try to influence in your own way. And that both of these things are happening all the time. Recognize that life is a convergence and that you are part of a larger web that is influencing you and you are influencing it at the same time. Both things are occurring. So I invite you to pause and take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Do that again, a deep breath in and a deep breath out. One last time, deep breath in and a deep breath out. So for today, choose what has clarity, choose what has purity, choose what has understanding. Today, cultivate some sattva in your life and see if you can spot the influences of nature and nurture throughout your day. And just a reminder, you're the only person who knows what's going on inside yourself. Other people can guess but you're the only one who can truly know. If you are embarking on a fertility journey and are ready to have your mind blown about what your body is really capable of and how it's impacted by the environment, then check out my book, The Ayurvedic Guide to Fertility. You can actually download the introduction to the book for free on my website at heathergrish.com. That's heather, G-R-Z-Y-C-H dot com. Read the intro for free and then buy the rest of this fertility enlightening book pretty much anywhere books are sold. You want a full human experience when you seek a healthcare provider and you don't want 15 minutes with someone who can't even try to find out the root cause of things because they're so overwhelmed themselves. You have a body, a mind, a heart, and dare I say it, even emotions. You're not crazy. Everything does affect you, and it's possible to feel better if you have the support you need. Set up an appointment with me to heal naturally. Go to heathergrish.com. That's heather, G-R-Z-Y-C-H dot com. Thank you for tuning in and dropping in with us today. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. I really want to hear your feedback. To learn more about my work, visit heathergrish.com. 
That's Heather, G-R-Z-Y-C-H dot com. And meet me here next time on The Wisdom of the Body. Mm-hmm.